الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم أما بعد يقول المصنف رحمه الله تعالى الكبير السادس حقوق الوالدين وقال الله تعالى وقضى ربك ألا تعبد إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما كولا كريما واخفض لهما جناح الظل من الرحمة وقل رب أرحمهما كما ربياني كما رب يعني صغيرا وقال الله تعالى ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حسنا الإمام الذهبي may Allah عز وجل be pleased with him said that the sixth kabira is the kabira of عقوق الوالدين being disobedient to one's parents and he brought the statement of Allah Ta'ala and your Lord has written and he has decreed and he has legislated that you should not worship anyone other than him and that you should be kind to your parents and you should have ihsan to your parents if one of them or both of them reach old age while you're living do not say to them oof but instead say to them a word that is nice so if one of them or both of them attain the old age and you are living don't ever say to them oof and never speak to them in hard terms but instead say to them the statement that is kareem and lower the wing of humility towards them and make dua for them and say oh my lord have mercy upon them in their old age as they used to have mercy upon me when I was younger. And he brought the second ayat of the Quran here concerning the issue of being kind to one's parents. وَوَصَيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا And we have given the wasiyah or the contract. We have given the contract and we have told mankind to be good and to do good by your parents. To have ihsan with them. You be a muhsin towards your parents. This is the chapter of today's daras ikhwani and we shall consider ourselves maymoon, fortunate, not lucky because there's no luck in Al-Islam. Everything happens by the qadr of Allah and it doesn't happen haphazardly. So we don't say we're lucky but instead we should all consider ourselves to be maymoon, fortunate to hear this dhikr here today. To be reminded of the importance that we all have, the Muslims from amongst us, who our parents are not Muslims, still we have to give the hukuk to our parents. As a result, as it relates to the issue of hukuk al walidain, this word aquk, the ain, qaf, wow, and qaf comes from the verb aqqa, hukuk. The word aqiqa is from this word. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ used to not like to call the aqiqa the aqiqa because the word itself implies disobedience. So he would not call the aqiqa the aqiqa if he can get away from it. There are certain ahadith that he called the aqiqa the aqiqa, but there's also a hadith where he prohibited us and he said that he didn't like the word aquq. And one of the wisdoms behind that that the scholars of Al-Islam said is because of the meaning of the word. Being disobedient to one's parents is a kabira from the kabair. As it relates to this ayah that we dealt with that Imam al-Dahabi mentioned, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ There are a number of points that we need to make very quickly. The first point is, قَضَى رَبُّكَ Your Lord he has given you a contract. He has given you a contract. He has made it an obligation upon you. It is a mithaq. Allah has put a contract upon us that we should take care of our parents. So the Muslim is held accountable in the dunya 
Yawm al-Qiyam is going to be questioned about all of his contracts. Ya ayyul ladina amanu, awfu bil-uquq, awfu bil-uhud, awal uqud Oh, you believe, take care of the contracts that you make. Awfu bil-uqud, take care of every contract. From the greatest contracts that there are, are the contracts that are connected to those people who are the closest to us, like our mothers and our fathers, our wives, our husbands. So the issue of your parents is that there is between you and between Allah Azawajal a contract to take care of them. And Allah has praised those people who take care of all of their contracts. Those people who they take care of what Allah ordered them to be connected. They connect those things. And there are a lot of things that we have been ordered to connect. We've been ordered to connect the lines in the salat. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam before beginning the salat, he used to turn around to the people and he used to say to the people, "Man wasal saf, wasalahullah. Wa man qat'a saf, qat'ahullah." Whoever connects the row, Allah will connect them. Whoever disconnects it, Allah will disconnect him and his affairs. So when you see a space in the row, you have been commanded to connect that row. And in connecting the row, your affairs will be connected. So don't worry about what people think. Don't be embarrassed if the Salat didn't start and you stay back there and there are spaces to fill in. Come and fill in the spaces, especially on the day of Al-Juma. We don't have time to get into that. But on the Juma day, Ikhwani, it is not from the Sunnah to sit way back there and to hold up the wall. If you find a space, you come and you connect that space, you'll get the rewards that are tremendous for the Musalli on the day of Juma. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna al-Arsh, Mu'allakatum, Inna al-Rahm, Mu'allakatum bil-Arsh, Tukul, Man wasalani, wasalahu Allah, Man qata'ani, qata'ahu Allah. Very the verily the womb, the rahm, it is hanging on and it is connected to the arsh of Allah. And the rahm is saying, Whoever connects me, Allah will connect him. Whoever disconnects me and severs me, Allah will disconnect him and sever him. So the worst person that you can disconnect is your mother and your father. So that's the first point as it relates to this ayat. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ Your Lord has given you a contract, made a contract, made an obligation upon you to connect the ties of relation to take care of your mother and your father. The second point that we want to make concerning this seriously important ayat is that in this ayat, as we have in many other ayat of the Qur'an and a hadith, Allah Ta'ala has put together His haqq and then after commanding us to take care of his haq, he told us next to take care of the haq of the parents. So he made the haq of Allah Azawajal and the haq of the parents together, as he did so many other issues in Al-Islam. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Do not make shirk with Allah and worship Allah. That's the haq of Allah. And then after that, give Allah his rights. So the right of the mother and the father is connected. It is maqroon with the rights of Allah Ta'ala. In another ayah he said, anishkur li wa Give thanks to me and give thanks to your parents. Allah is the one who gave you life. He is the one who provided for you. He is the one who bestowed upon you your sight, your hearing, and all of the ni'mah that we cannot count. And he did that not because he needed them, but he did that through your parents. So give thanks to Allah for being the khaliq who gave you what he gave you, and give the hukuk of your parents to them for being the vessel. What is the hukuk of the parents, as the ulama say? The haq of the father is, he has the haq of al-infaq, that you spend on your dad when he needs the money. And the haq of the mother is that you give her the haq of the ishfaq. That your mother, because she's da'ifa, because she's a woman, the stosu bin nisa khaira. I tell you people, advise you people, be good by the women. All of the women. Your wives, your daughters, your mothers, every woman. A stosu bin nisa khaira. I advise you to take care of the women. 
So the haq of the father is that he has the haq of being given money and taken care of in his old age. One of the companion's father used to come and steal his mother, his money in his son's absence. The son went to the Prophet ﷺ and complained about what his father was doing, thinking that Rasulullah ﷺ was going to get on the father. The Rasul ﷺ said to the son, Ennaka, ennaka, anta wa maluka li abik. You and your money belong to your father. You and your money belong to your father. And he allowed him to steal his money or to take his money. So the father has the haq of al-infaq and the mother has the haq of al-ishfaq. So Allah has put their hukuk together after his. Wa'abudullah wa la tushriku bihi shay'a wa bilwalidayni ihsana. Another ayat. Worship Allah and don't make shit with him and take care of your parents. Give your parents the ihsan. The third point, ikhwani, is what the Prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it mentions in this ayah. Emma yablughanna indaka al-kibr ahaduhuma aw kilahuma. If one of them attains the age in which they are old people, one of them or two of them, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ Don't say to them, oh, uff. Don't say to them any kalimat that your parents may find harmful and they may dislike it. Concerning this issue, the Prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, رَغِمَ أَنفٌ ثُمَّ رَغِمَ أَنفٌ ثُمَّ رَغِمَ أَنفٌ مَنْ أَدْرَكَ وَالِدَيْهِ كَلَاهُمَا أَوْ أَحَدُهُمَا ثُمَّ لَنْ يَدْخُلْ جَنَّةٌ May his nose be destroyed, have dirt on it, be dragged in the dirt. May his nose be dragged in the dirt. May his nose be dragged in the dirt. The one who, he grows up to find his parents, both of them or one of them. And then he doesn't go into the Jannah. He's older, he's of the age where he has intellect. He can discern the right from what is wrong. He grows up and he finds both of his parents living, or one of them living, either one, and he doesn't go into the Jannah. In another narration, he got on the minbar on the first step and he said, Ameen, stood on the second step, said Ameen, stood on the third step, Ameen, turned around and said to the companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or Radiallahu Anhum Ajma'een, لَقَدْ جَآنِي جِبْرِيلُ فَقَالَ يَا مُحَمِّدْ مَنْ أَدْرَكَ وَالِدَيْهِ كَلَاهُمَا أَوْ أَحَدُهُمَا ثُمَّ لَنْ يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ فَبْعَدَهُ اللَّهِ قُلْ أَمِينَ فَقُدْتُ أَمِينَ He got on the first step. He said to the people when he turned around, Jibreel came to me when I got on the first step. And he said to me, يَا مُحَمِّدْ Whoever from your community grows up and he reaches the age where he has his intellect, he's a grown adult, and he finds his mother and his father or one of them, and he doesn't go to the Jannah. May Allah put him far, far away from the Rahmah of Allah, from the Jannah of Allah. And then Jibreel said, say Ameen to that dua. Jibreel made dua against the people who don't take care of their parents. So Ikhwani, with all of the hukuk of the parents. Unfortunately, there are many people who are sitting right here who are not on good terms with their mother or their mother or their father. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُ مِنْ تَوَلَّيْتُ مِنْ تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَتِّوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَعْنَهُمُ اللَّهِ فَأَصَمَّهُمْ وَأَعْمَى أَبْصَارُهُمْ It may be. It may be. That once you grow up and you get power and you get money, it may be, after Allah gives you power in the earth, that you will turn around and start to create mischief in the earth and cut off the ties of your relationship. Those are the people who Allah has cursed and Allah has made them deaf and Allah has made them blind. He made them deaf and blind to the reality of you are a person who is not thankful for the fact that your parents gave you the gift of life be ibnillahi ta'ala. And that's why we say over and over again, Ikhwani, and this is going to come up insha'Allah. Someone wants to get married to a brother or the brother wants to get married to a sister. Don't destroy your family relationships to marry any woman. Don't destroy your family relationships to marry any man or any woman. 
The girl is religious. The mother and the father don't want you to marry that girl. Don't run off and marry that girl like that. You have to make jihad and try to convince them. I'm not saying don't marry the girl. Marry the girl but knock on the right door and go through the right door. If the mother and the father are too difficult, then you have to do what you have to do with what is halal. But do not take the girl and run off. The girl should never, ever, ever run off because her mother and her father don't agree. She's Sharif, she's from Quraysh, really from Ahl al-Bayt. And they don't want the girl to marry anyone but from Ahl al-Bayt. Or the parents are ignorant and racist, don't want the girl to marry anyone but someone from her village, her cousin. We say she has the right not to marry that boy if she doesn't want. But don't run off with the brother. Don't elope with the brother or the sister. And then you cut off the ties of relationship and you become blind and deaf to the fact that it is a kabira from the kabair. Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, وَوَسَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمَّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنِ And we gave this contract, we legislated it, we made it an obligation that mankind should be diligent and give an ihsan to his parents. His mother carried him with heaviness on top of heaviness. And she suckled him for two years. The scholars of Al-Islam say the meaning of she carried him heaviness on top of heaviness is the pregnancy and dropping the birth, dropping the low was one heaviness. And then the second heaviness was his tarbiyah taking care of him for two years. Some of them say the one first heaviness is carrying him, the second heaviness is dropping him as a load. That alone we can't give our mother her hukuk back. As you're going to see. As you're going to see. In the book Al-Adab Al-Mufrad by Imam Al-Bukhari, a man came to Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and said, Ya Abdullah ibn Abbas, there was a lady I wanted to marry her. And her people refused my proposal. And they married her to another man. So my jealousy got the best of me and shaitan was made with swas. So I went and I killed the girl. Stood on her and hit her with an axe and I killed her. Can I make toba? Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, Is your mother living? He said, no. He said, Allahumma sta'an. The man left. The people asked Abdullah ibn Abbas, why when the man told you his situation, you asked him about his mother? He said, radiallahu anhu, I don't know of anything that he can do to wipe away the crime of killing someone else other than by doing good to his mother. Not his mother and his father. He said his mother, radiallahu anhu. He was of the opinion that a person who kills someone, another Muslim, who unjustly kills another Muslim, he's going to be in the hellfire forever. That was the opinion of Abdullah ibn Abbas. And he had the statement of Allah Ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa, وَمَنْ يَقْتُ الْمُؤْمِنَ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ خَالِدًا فِيهَا He'll always be in the Jahannam, anyone who kills a believer. So Ikhwani, our mothers gave birth to us, they carried us. That alone, we can never repay it. As it relates to the ahadith of Al-Imam Al-Nawawi, Al-Imam Al-Dhahab, in the ayahs that he mentioned, since our mothers, Ikhwani, carried us, gave birth to us, suckled us, made a lot of efforts in jihad for us, Allah gave a rhetorical question in the Quran, وَهَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ and is the reward for doing good nothing other than doing good? The one who does good, is his reward anything other than that he'll be rewarded with good? If you do good, Allah is not going to reward you with evil. So there's a principle in our religion that comes from this hadith, this ayah. And that principle says, al jazau min jins al-amil you will get rewarded according to the action that you do. So when people do good to you, when they give you ihsan, then you in turn have to do ihsan back to the people. So our mothers and our fathers, no one gave us more ihsan than our mothers and fathers. Especially those of us who were born Muslims, raised as practicing Muslims. Your father made sure 
that you prayed Salat al-Fajr when you were young. You didn't understand it. He was rough. He was tough. You'll get a serious scolding or beating if you didn't show up for Fajr. You couldn't understand that. But right now, at the age where you are right now, you can understand it. That's the ihsan of your father and your mother. So how is a person going to repay it back by marrying a girl who's a religious girl? Obedient wife. And he chooses his wife over his mother who may be ignorant. It's not permissible, ikhwani. As you're going to see, inshallah, in the ahadith that Imam al-Dhahabi brings. So we repay our parents with the ihsan that they gave to us. In the first hadith, Al-Imam Al-Dhahabi rahimahullah ta'ala brought the authentic hadith where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and he asked his companions, Ala unabbi'ukum bi akbar al-kaba'ir Should I not tell you people what is the biggest of the major sins? They said, yes ya Rasulullah, what is that? He said, Al-ishraqu billah wa uququl walidain Again, making shirk with Allah and then next to it, the second kabira is not being, being disobedient to your parents. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said that a man came and asked, Ya Rasulullah, ayyul amali ahabbu Allah. Which of the actions that we can do is the most beloved actions to Allah? He says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, as-salatu ala waqtiha. That you pray, give Allah his rights. You pray at the proper time, the prescribed time. The man said, thumma ay. And then after that, what's the best thing that Allah loves? He said, bir walidain. After the salah, after the haq of Allah, that you take care of your parents. He didn't say, bir zawj or bir zawja. Bir walidain. Your mother has more rights over, the, over you than your wife does. More rights over you than your wife does. So from the Akbar al-Kabair is Uquq al-Walidain. Wa qala sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam Radha Allah fi radha al-Walid Wa sakhatu Allah fi sakhat al-Walid The pleasure of Allah, the Radha, the Radwan, the pleasure of Allah is in pleasing your parents. And the anger of Allah is in displeasing your parents. Whoever is sitting here right now and he's on bad terms with his parents, his mother and his father are angry with him or one of them, then Allah is angry with you. If you have done something that's haram, what is the meaning of the anger of Allah? Is with the anger of the parents? It is when you do something against the religion that caused your parents to become upset with you. You are wrong, you're in the wrong religiously, and your mother and your father are upset with you. Then Allah becomes upset, angry with you as a result of that. It doesn't mean when your parents are ignorant and the girl becomes religious and she puts the hijab on with the niqab and the mother says, hey, this is backwards, take that off. She says, I'm not going to take it off. The mother becomes upset. That's not what this hadith is talking about. This hadith is talking about if a person <coughs> makes his parents upset because he wants to do something that's mustahab and the mother and the father don't want him to do it, he shouldn't do it. If he wants to do something makruh, it's not haram, it's dislike, but there's no sin. And the mother and the father don't want him to do it, but he does it. And they become angry with him. Then the anger of Allah is in that issue. The mustahab is something you should do. The man wants to pray the sunnah prayer. But the mother wants him, the mother needs him, like the mother of Juraj. Ya Juraj, Ya Juraj, come here right now. While he's playing the sunnah, Juraj said no. My salat or my mother, my salat or my mother, I'm going to keep praying. Ibadatullah. It wasn't permissible for him to pray the sunnah when it's going to cause him to lose what is an obligation. Someone may say, but my mother, she may want me to do something and I'm preoccupied with an ibadah from the ibadat, from the mustahabat. And if I were to do that, I'm going to lose a lot of reward. You're not going to lose the reward. You'll get the reward because of your niyyah. In addition to that, ikhwani, you'll get more reward for obeying your parents. Man taraka shay'in lillah, awwaduhu Allah ma huwa khayru min. Whoever leaves something for Allah, Allah will give him that which is better than it. 
So that's the meaning of the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the parents. Now if the parent were to order the child to do something that's haram, then it's haram to do what they're telling you to do. If they told you to leave the wajib from the wajibat of al-Islam, then you cannot do that. All of these ayat that talk about the hukuk of the parents being connected with the hukuk, the hukuk of Allah and the Quran and the Sunnah, and yet Allah still said in the Quran, "Wa in jahadaka, ala in tushrika bi, ma leesa laka bi al, fala tu tihuma, wa sahib huma fi dunya marufa." And if your mother and your father order you to do something to make shikh with me that you have no knowledge about, then don't obey them in that thing. But have a good companionship with them in the dunya. So the happiness or the pleasure of Allah is in the pleasure of the parents. And the anger of Allah is you angering your parent. Whether he's sitting here and his mother and his father is upset with him, mad with him. And you were wrong concerning that Allah is angry with you. He says, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Al walid awsatu abwaab al jannah. The mother and the father are the best doors from the doors of al jannah. The jannah has eight doors. From this hadith, we know one of the doors is the door of the parent. Another door is the door of al rayyan for the sa'imin, those who fast. The six other doors for us to put a name over it or for us to say so and so will go in that door, you need the delil from the Quran and the Sunnah with the name of that door. The mother and the father, they have a door that you can enter into Jannah. So anyone who grows up and he finds them, he doesn't go into one of those doors, may Allah put them far away, Jibril said. And the Prophet wasallam said, Ameen. This hadith has a story behind it. A man came and he told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I have a woman that I love, I married her, and my mother orders me to divorce her. Not the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, another man. I married a woman that I love, I tremendously love her, my heart is connected to her. And my mother orders me to make divorce, to divorce her. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the parent is the best door to Jannah. That was his response. So the scholars took from this hadith a clear delil. If it is a question of making your mother happy and making your wife happy, your mother is a haq and ola. She has more rights. Any woman that you're married to who doesn't help you to practice the hadith, Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was asked, Ya Rasulullah, man ahaqqu nas bi husni sahabati, who has more rights over me? He said, Ummuka, and then who? Ummuka, and then who? Ummuka, and then who? Abuka. He didn't say, Zawjatuka, 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 then your mother, and then your father. Your mother has more rights over you to please her than your wife. Your mother is jahila. She's self-centered. Your mother is ignorant. A person's mother, she only thinks about herself. She's a amateur dunya. She loves the dunya. She doesn't know about the deen. She makes outrageous requests from you. She's wrong most of the time. What do we do in these cases? Wallahi, she still has more rights than your wife. And the woman who you marry, who doesn't help you to give your mother her rights, why did you marry her? Why marry a woman who's not going to help you to fulfill this hadith? And the sister who's in that situation, don't think that we're saying that it's easy for her. No, her mother-in-law is ignorant, is a fitna. But that mother-in-law is a door to Jannah for her. The lady came to complain about her husband to Rasulullah. Rasulullah told that lady, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Unzri ilayhi, fa innu jannatuka wa narak. Look at your husband and your position to your husband because he's your paradise or your hellfire. He's someone who can help you, wife, to get to the Jannah. So the lady has to try to get to Jannah by helping her husband to take care of the hukuk that his mother has over him. For you brothers though and myself, let us not, not practice this hadith by giving our, our, our wives the feeling that 
we're more inclined to make them happy over our wives, over our mothers. No. If you can make both sides happy, then that's what you have to do. But if it was this one or that one, your mother who gave you life, be idhnillah, has more rights. Three times. Three times. So fear Allah as it relates to your mothers and your wives. As it relates to your mothers and your children. Those three men who went into the cave and the rock went over the cave and it covered the whole cave and each one said something of what they did. One of the men said, Oh Allah, you know my mother and my father, they were old people. And I used to go and I used to milk my animals and I would bring them milk. And I would find my mother and my father, they're sleeping. And my kids would be screaming. They were hungry. They wanted to eat. They see the food, the milk, and they, it makes them even more hungry. So they start screaming. Allah, you know that I didn't give them to eat. I stood over my mother and father, waiting for them to wake up out of fear that they were, I didn't want to disturb them. I just stood there. You know that I did that for yourself. So make the thing open. And the thing was open. Another delil. Your mother and your father have more rights than your children, than your wife. As for the sister and her husband, her husband has more rights. She has to obey her husband over her father. Her husband is the Imam, the Amir, her Khalifa. And maybe during the question and answers, inshallah, that will become more apparent. In this hadith, those of you who have the book, there's a very important point you have to pay attention to in the book. It said, Al Walid Awsat Abuab al Jannah. For in shit, fahfad. When shit, fadayya. The mother and father are the best door in the paradise. And then it said, so if you want to protect it, protect it. And if you want to lose it, lose it. This is not part of the hadith. Even in this book, they included it as the statement of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They put it between the quotations. So they made the whole statement, the statement of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah's kalam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stops at Al-Walid Awsatu Abwaab Al-Jannah. Stop. And then Abu Darda said, whoever wants to hold on to that door, let him hold on to it, protect it, maintain it. Whoever wants to lose it, then let him lose it. So that aspect of the hadith is mudraj, is idraj. That's when the narrator says something that when the person heard it, he thought it was the hadith. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu sat before the people and he wanted to teach them about the importance of making the good wudu. So he says, Sat radiallahu anhu, Asbighul wudu, waylun lil aqab min al nar. He said, I heard Rasulullah say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he said, Do a good wudu. Woe unto the ankle bones from the hellfire. What the Prophet said was only woe unto the ankle bones from the hellfire. That's the kalam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Huraira said, make a good wudu. So the scholars of Al-Islam, the scholars of Al-Hadith, as a refutation on the lion Qur'ani, liars, wallahi. Those people who say we don't take the sunnah because we don't know what's authentic and what's not authentic. The ulama of Al-Islam did not leave any hadith except that we know it is okay or it's not okay. There's not a single hadith except that they dissected it and they explained what it meant, was it authentic, when it was said, who said it, and on and on and on. So anyone who wants to reject the sunnah, he has rejected Al-Islam and he's a liar. So that hadith is mudraj. The last kalam is the kalam of Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. And then Al-Imam al-Dhahabi brings the famous hadith as a delil to show the importance of taking care of the parents. Pay attention, ikhwani. The hadith said, Al-Jannatu tahta aqdam al-ummahat. Paradise is under the feet of the mothers. Paradise is under the feet of the mothers. Everyone heard this hadith. This is not an authentic hadith. Not only did the Prophet not say it sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but it is an extremely weak hadith. It is a hadith that is munkar. And it's not true. Not in the chain of narration, nor in the meaning. Jannah is under the feet of a lady who doesn't pray, a lady who's a zaniya, a lady who doesn't wear hijab, she's a criminal, a mushrika. 
even if she's a Muslim, she doesn't pray. The closest she comes to making rakur is putting something in the oven, taking something out of the oven. She curses the religion. You have a beard, she curses the beard. She's an enemy to, us, to this deen. Jannah is under her feet. La wallahi. Jannah is not under the feet of someone like that. There was a man who came and he wanted to make jihad with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet asked him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi wa فَقَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِلْزَمْهَا فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ تَحْتَ رِجْلَيْهَا Yes, do you have a mother, your mother living? Yes. She's living, Ya Rasulullah. He said, go and take care of her. Be with her. Be around her. Because Jannah is under her feet. That lady who's a muttaqiyya, saliha, mu'mina. So someone sitting here, Maybe your mother, maybe your grandmother, Jannah is under her feet, which goes again to show Ikhwan, the level of the mother in this deen, especially the mother who is religious, that the Jannah who the Prophet said about it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fiha, Ma la Ain Ra'at, Wala Udin, Sami'at, Wa Ma Khatra Ala Bali Bashar. In the Jannah is what no eyes have ever seen. No ears have ever heard some of the stuff in the Jannah. Things in the Jannah that the people can't even contemplate what's in the Jannah. And that religious mother, that exalted place is under her feet. The righteous, religious Muslim woman who has given birth and raised her children on Al-Islam. So Jannah can be under the feet of our mother Aisha. Khadija Maymuna, Um Salama, Um Habiba, Radiallahu Anhunna. Jannah is under the feet of our mother Khadija, Radiallahu Anha. But Jannah is not under the feet of every woman, whether she is a Muslim or a non Muslim. So that hadith is from what has been famously quoted as being a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and it is not authentic. Do not say this hadith again. The Prophet says sallallahu alayhi wasallam, paradise is under the feet of the mothers. No. Paradise can be under the feet of a particular mother who has the deen. But we don't know that unless we have some delil for that particular issue. Al-Imam al-Dhahabi brought the next narration فقال, جاء رجل إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يستأذنه في الجهاد معه فقال أهي والدك قال الرجل نعم قال النبي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم ففيهما فجاهد ففيهما فجاهد A man was about to go to perform the jihad Rasulullah made the call for the jihad and the jihad is fard al-kifaya. He called the people for the jihad. The man came and he wanted to participate in the jihad. The Prophet wasallam asked him, is your mother living, your parents, are they living? He said, yes. He said, then go back and make jihad in and with your mother and your father. Make jihad in and with your mother and your father. Who is the mujahid? And what is the jihad in Al-Islam? He told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al-Mujahid Man jahad nafsuhu Fi dhatillah Wa fi riwayah Fi ta'atillah The mujahid is the one Who makes jihad against his nafs In obeying Allah He has a mother who's ignorant Self-centered All kinds of problems between his mother and his wife Make jihad between them You're in the middle Make jihad, tolerate your mother, educate your mother. Be patient with your mother. There is a jihad with your mother. This hadith, Ikhwani, is a very important hadith and it has some fiqh that we have to mention concerning it. When the Prophet used to encourage the people to make jihad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah revealed a number of ayat telling the people about the evil of not going to make jihad. Ya ayyul ladheena amin, ma lakum? إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ انْفِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثَاقَلْتُ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ أَرَدِيتُمْ بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ فَمَا مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ إِلَّا تَنْفِرُوا يُعَذِّبُكُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا 
When it is said to you, go out in the cause of Allah and fight and kill the kuffar and defend your deen. Why is it that you hold on tenaciously to the earth? Do you prefer the hayat dunya over Allah making jihad? And whoever prefers the hayat dunya over that, he's going to be punished. Because the hayat dunya in comparison to the hereafter is nothing but a little bit. If you don't go out, Allah is going to prepare for you a grievous punishment and change you with a different people. And what you do, do not, it doesn't hurt Allah one bit. And he's able and capable of doing everything. And yet when the boy came to make jihad, Rasulullah knew his condition, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, go back and make jihad in your parents. Because the jihad for the person who's taking care of his parents is not an obligation upon him. In the fard al-kifaya, right? Going to get knowledge. Someone wants to go to Yemen. Someone gets a scholarship to go to Medina or to Mecca or Riyadh or wherever in the dunya to get knowledge. He's been given an opportunity to go and learn or memorize the Quran from someone who has a chain of narration of recitation all the way back to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He gets a chance to go meet the biggest scholar in the dunya. But in going to do that, he's going to neglect his mother and his father. His mother and the father have more rights over him than what he's going to do. And similar to it is his wife and his children. Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu or Zubair ibn Awam, Zubair ibn Awam, when he made the Hajj with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they were coming back from Mecca, his wife Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, was pregnant. She went all the way to Mecca, did the rites of Hajj, pregnant. This mother. She came all the way back on a camel. Before they entered into Medina, the pains of childbirth started to come. She wants to deliver the baby. So they had to stop. As Zubair told some of his relatives, Hey, you stay with my wife. I'm going to remain with Rasulullah wasallam, so that I can continue to see the ahkam of Hajj. Didn't the Prophet tell them before they left Medina, he gathered the people and said, Take from me the rights of Hajj. So everyone was looking at everything that he did. As Zubair wanted to know knowledge, wants to know about the Hajj. You, my brother, my cousin, you take care of my wife while she has the baby. Rasulullah told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no, you take care of your wife. So he had to remain with his family while the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, while the scholar and the knowledge left. So how are you going to go and study in Medina and your children are going to be lost on welfare? It's not permissible. It's not permissible. You have to stay with your parents. You have to stay with your children. You have to stay with those people you are responsible for. The student of knowledge, Ikhwan, more than anyone, he's the one who tries to take care of and understand these issues. He takes care of his mother and his wife, his mother and his father, and he realizes in taking care of them comes the pleasure of Allah which will allow him to have a happy marriage, which will allow him to be a good student of knowledge, insha'Allah ta'ala. I already mentioned the hadith where the man came and he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the Prophet, who has more rights? for me to take care of him. He said, your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father. There's another narration that he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ummuka wa abaka wa uhtuka wa akhaka wa adnaka adnaka. It's from the fasaha of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who has the most rights over me, Ya Rasulullah? Ummuka. Your mother, and then who? Abaka, your father, and then who? Uhtuka, your sister, and then who? Akhaka, your brother, and then who? And then your relatives according to that. So your mother has the most rights three times, and then your father, and then your sister, and then your brother. As it relates to the sister, Ikhwani, those of us who have sisters who are not married, your sister has a lot of rights on you. That you look for a husband for her. Or you have a sister who was married and she's divorced or she's a widow. You, her brother, you're responsible for her and her children. She has hukuk. That's our deen. If the girl gets divorced, 
she goes back to her father's house. She doesn't go to a part of this city to live by herself, if we can help it. If we can help it, maybe you can't help it. It's already too many people in your existing home. La yukallifullahu nafsin illa wus'aha. Your sister gets divorced. She has rights that you maintain your sister and her children. But I have my own family and I don't make that much money. Okay, no problem. Go and take your niece and take your nephews and spend time with them and protect them and teach them the deen. We have left our sisters. Ummuka wa abaka wa uhtaka wa akhaka. Your mother, your father, your sister, and then your brother. So we want to remind all of you brothers of the hukuk of our sisters. Those who have been divorced, we have to do a better job inshallah ta'ala or at least start to think about what we should be doing for them in terms of their children. And Imam al-Dhahibi rahimahullahu ta'ala said, وَرُوِيَ عَنِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَا يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ عَاقِ وَلَا مِنَّانِ وَلَا مُدْمِنْ خَمَرْ وَلَا مُؤْمِنْ بِالسِّحْرِ and it is reported that Rasulullah says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will not enter into the Jannah if he is aq, disobedient to his parents. Or he's a manan. And manan is the person who when you give him something, he reminds you what he gave you. You remember I gave you that? So you should do this for me. Al mannu, al manan. If you're going to give, just give for Allah. The one who does that, will not go into the Jannah. As well as the one who's addicted to sharab, to khamr, or to crack, or to marijuana, cannabis, or to any other narcotic or drug. He won't go into the Jannah. And he won't go into the Jannah, the one who believes in magic. Either put in magic on people, or once magic is put on him, he does magic to get the magic off of him. This hadith seems to be weak. I couldn't check the hadith because my books are still in prison to this very day. But it seems from the minhaj of an Imam al dhahabi he said, Ruwiya. So whenever the ulama say, Ruwiya, it's been reported, it's been recorded, it's been narrated. You get the feeling that it is not authentic. That's his way of not saying, Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam. وقال عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله عنهما جاء أعرابي إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا رسول الله ما الكبائر قال الإشراق بالله قال ثم ماذا قال ثم أقوق الوالدين قال ثم ماذا قال ثم اليمين الغموس Abdullah bin Umar said that a man came to him صلى الله عليه وسلم to the prophet and said يا رسول الله what are the major sins he said that you make shirk with Allah that you say يا محمد that you slaughter for other than Allah. That you obey Abu Hanifa over Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when it's clear what Rasulullah said is in contradiction to what Abu Hanifa said or did. And you say, no, I prefer what Abu Hanifa says. That is kufr. What is the greatest sin, Ya Rasulullah? To make shirk with Allah. And then after that, what? To be disobedient to your parents. And then after that, what? For a person, and this is going to come up insha'Allah ta'ala to swear and he's lying. يقول الإمام الذهبي رحمه الله تعالى وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يدخل الجنة عاق ولا مكذب القدر أو مكذب بالقدر He will not enter into the Jannah The one who is disobedient to his parents nor the one who disbelieves in the divine decree in the Qadr وروى عيسى بن تلحى ابن أبيد الله أن عمر ابن مرة الجهني رضي الله عنه أن الرجل قال يا رسول الله أرأيت إن صليت الصلاة الصلوات الخمس وصمت رمضان وأديت الزكاة وهججت البيت فماذا لي قال من فعل ذلك كان مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء إلا أن يعق والديه The man came and said يا رسول الله if I pray the five prayers I fast in Ramadan I give the zakat and I make the hajj to the house I practice all of Islam then what, 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 is, what else do I have to do? He said, anyone who does that, he will be raised up with the Nabiyeen, and the Siddiqeen, and the Shuhada, and the Salihin, except if he was disobedient to his parents. 
if he was disobedient to his parents and he did all of these ibadat of al-Islam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give him that reward and that virtue. وَعَنْ بُكَّارِ بْنُ عَبْدِ الْعَزِيزِ بْنُ أَبِي بُكَيْرَ قَالْ حَدَّثَنَا أَبِي أَنْ أَبِي بَكْرَ مَرْفُوعَ كُلُّ ذَنُوب يُؤَخِرَهُ اللَّهُ يؤخر الله منها ما شاء إلى يوم القيامة إلى أقوق الوالدين فإنه يؤجل لصاحبه Every sin Allah will delay it. He won't hold you responsible for it. It's possible. Every sin, any sin a person does, Allah may relay punishing him until يوم القيامة. Put him in the hellfire and clean him up. But in the dunya, Allah may still give him money. Allah may still make his life easy. Every sin that a person does, Allah may delay it, may delay punishing him or giving him the results of what he put forth from the evil. But Allah won't delay uquq al walidin If a person is bad to his parents, then Allah will give him what he deserves in the dunya. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, بابان مؤجلان في الدنيا البغي وعق والديه Two doors Allah will speed up the recompense for the person who falls into these sins or goes into the door the person who oppresses other people and the person who is not good to his parents إن الله حرم عليكم أقوق الأمهات ووعد البنات ومنع الوهات Allah may haram for you being disrespectful and disobedient to your mothers. And He may haram for you burying your daughters alive. And He may haram for you man'an wahat. Man'a means the person when he's asked, he doesn't give. And hat means the one who goes around begging. Can I have? Can you give me? Can I have? He made that haram for you to be a beggar. So the point is, uquq al-ummahat is a kabira from the kaba'ir in al-Islam. وَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَا يَجْزِي وَلَدٌ وَالِدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَجْدُهُ مَمْلُوكًا فَيَشْتَرِيَهُ فَيَعْتِقَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Prophet says, صلى الله عليه وسلم, pay attention to this hadith, إخوان الصحيح مسلم. A man will never be able to repay his father. Never in the dunya. There's no way in the world it's impossible for a man to repay his father. If he can't repay his father, your mother, your mother, your mother. Then it's out of the question. You can't repay your mother. A man will never be able to repay his father unless he found his father as a slave to another man. His father was put into slavery and he found him like that. So he purchases his father's freedom and then he lets him go. That's the only way a man can repay his father. So none of our fathers are going to be slaves, the real meaning of slavery. But some of our fathers are slaves, slaves to the shirk and the kufr of the peer. The father is a slave to the peer. If the peer told your dad, give me half of your life savings, your father would do it. Believing that the, the peer is a wali from the only of Allah. So free your fathers from the slavery of those type of people. If a man finds his father as a slave and he purchases his freedom, he purchases it and the son gave his father some of his rights. But Ikhwan, this hadith is a hadith that has some fiqh. It goes to show in the religion of Al-Islam is haram for a man to own his own father. Slavery is a part of Islam and it's going to return. And slavery doesn't mean a group of people, a particular color, a nation of slaves. Anyone can be a slave. Whoever fights against the religion when jihad is fought correctly, the Muslims defeat them, take them as slaves, and take their women as captives, and the women are your property, and he has 20, and he has 40, and he's a rich man, and he has 600. It's all from the religion. If a man found his father as a slave, he can never put his father in slavery from this hadith. Automatically, the father is free. But from the last day, there are going to be people who are going to put their parents in slavery. In the hadith of Jibreel, about Iman and Ihsan and Islam, 
from the signs of the hour. And tara al amata, and talat al amatu rabbataha. You will see the slave girl giving birth to her mother. That's one of the signs of the hour. Some of the scholars said the meaning of that is people will put their mothers and their fathers in slavery and have them in slavery. It'll get to that level where the people treat their parents in that type of a way. He went on to say, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, that the Prophet says, Al Khala, the Manzilat al Um. The maternal mother is like your mother. Khwan, with a show of hands, your mother, she has some sisters, and your father has some sisters. How many of you are closer to your mother's sisters? Put your hand up. How many are closer to your father's sisters? Now some of you didn't put your hands up. Let's try it again. How many of you are closer to your mother's sisters? How many? Look around. It's going to always be like that in every masjid. Because your mother's sisters look at you like you are her daughter, her sons. That's the fitrah of Allah in women. So Rasulullah says, Al-Khala bimanzilat al-Um. Your mother's older sister, younger sister, when your mother had you, she looked at you, your aunt, your khala, like you are her flesh and blood. And he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Am Walid. And your father's brother is like the father. Your father's brother is like the father, your uncle from your father's side. This hadith, Al-Khala bi Manzilat Al-Um, it has a story behind it. It's a long hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. When the companions went and conquered Mecca, and they opened up Mecca, Ali ibn Abi Talib and his brother Jafar ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhuma, along with Zayd ibn Haritha, may Allah be pleased with all of them, they saw the daughter of Hamza. They saw the daughter of Hamza, the uncle of Ali and his brother Jafar. Hamza was dead by that time. So they went to Mecca and all three of them said, I want to take care of the, the girl. So they went to the Prophet and they said, Ali said, Ya Rasulullah, this is Hamza's daughter, my niece. Hamza, you know, is my uncle. So I have more rights. His brother Jafar said, Ya Rasulullah, this is Hamza, my uncle's daughter, and her aunt, her khala, is my wife. Zayd ibn, Zayd ibn Haritha said, Ya Rasulullah, she is the daughter of my brother. Zayd is not even related to Hamza, he means in Islam. I want to take care of the Muslim girl. Her father was a man of virtue. If I take care of his daughter, inshallah, it's going to help me Yom Al-Qiyam as well. Rasulullah sallallahu said, Al-Khala bi manzilat al-Um. The mother, the, 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 the khala, the maternal aunt, is like the mother. And he gave the girl to Jafar. So in the law of custody, when the aunt is there, the judge in Al-Islam can allow the khala to take over the child. The khala, she is up there as it relates to who comes in line of taking care of the custody of the child. Because the her daughter or her sister, the mother of the child, they both looked at the child the same way. We're almost done here with the last ather. And it is the ather of Wahab ibn Munabbih, who was from the Tabi'een, and one of the first people to have a book of hadith written. And we want to dig into the archives to pass out a thing that we wrote concerning Wahab ibn Munabbih and some advice that he gave to a man who was about to go with the Khawarij. And it's similar to the people of Jah wa Ta'deel today. The fitna of this issue with Al-Imam Wahab ibn Munabbih. Tremendous scholar who was a scholar of the Israeliyat. The narrations from the Jews and the Christians. Anyway, without going through it, it's from the Israeliyat. We don't believe it. We don't disbelieve it. It said that Allah Ta'ala said to Musa, Ya Musa, respect and take care of your parents. For verily, whoever takes care of his parents, I will increase his age, his lifespan, and I will give him a child that will take care of him. 
and whoever is disobedient to his parents, I will make his lifespan short. And I will give him a child that is disrespectful to him. So Kaab, Kaab al-Ahbar, one of the other ulama from the Tabi'een who knew a lot about the Israeliyat. Kaab, he said, I swear by Allah, the one who my soul is in his hands, Allah will speed up the life of an individual who is not good to his parents and he'll punish him. He'll punish him and give him his punishment quickly. And Allah will increase the good in the life of the slave who is good to his parents. This is from the Israeliyat. We don't believe that Allah said this to Musa unless it came in the Quran and the Sunnah. But everything that was said in here, we have authentic hadith that support all of it. So Ikhwani, Maybe you didn't know prior to today the seriousness and the severity of taking care of your parents. Now you heard the statements of the Prophet ﷺ. So let us begin from this point on, inshallah, to try to be diligent with our mothers as well as our fathers.